Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Rough by Michael and Molly Hardwick Anna Vermilion leant forward to examine her image more closely in the mirror. The light was poor, filtering through small panes of greenish bottle glass in a window half hidden by rich, heavy curtains. Anna clapped her hands and imperiously demanded a candle branch to be lit, though it was barely three o'clock in the afternoon. Elizabeth, her maid, made a face behind Anna's back, but obediently did as she was bidden. She did not do to oppose her mistress' command, however extravagant or unreasonable. Candles in the daytime, when they cost so dearly and the poorer streets of Antwerp were crammed with people who could barely afford a rushlight after dark. But if you were the spoiled only daughter of one of the richest merchants in the city, you could afford as many candles as the image of the Virgin Mary in the cathedral. You could also afford a bit of charity to the poor. But catch this one throwing any coins from her coach or even passing on a gown she was tired of to her maid that had but one to her name. No, thought Elizabeth bitterly. She'd hoard them in a chest for the moths to fatten on, rather than see another girl look handsomer in them than herself. Elizabeth did her mistress a certain injustice, for Anna Vermilion was beautiful by the standards of her time. She resembled somewhat the Queen of England in youth, having the same pointed oval structural face, high bridged nose, and small mouth. Her hair was of the rare true golden, naturally curling, so that when washed, it snapped back into a multitude of ringlets, like small watch springs. Her eyes were cold in expression, but of a striking speedwell blue, her skin as white as the flowers of the privet. At the age of twenty, she still possessed all her teeth, a remarkable achievement in 1582. And the terrible hand of smallpox had not touched her. She was small-statured and slender to the point of thinness, in delicate contrast to the sturdy Flemish build which was more usual among the maids of Antwerp. The late King of England had not been at all pleased to find himself matrimonially yoked with that other Anna, whom he unsurously described as a great Flanders mare. It was a pity, Anna thought, that she herself had not been my Lady of Cleves. The English succession would certainly have turned out very differently. However, no king had yet offered for Anna's hand in marriage. More disquietingly, no commoner had done so. Neither her looks nor her riches could lure the young men of Antwerp into a proposal. Merchant society was a small world. In the families of Ryswick, Willems, Clays, all moneyed, all blessed with sons, it was well known that Anna's eligibility was offset by her notorious bad temper, hotter and meanness. Shrews were not popular. Erasmus of Holland had written a, a colloquy against them, which translated may have inspired a very young man in Warwickshire to write a certain famous play, but that was in the future. He was not yet to wed to his own shrew. Nobody wanted a cursed wife, and it was pretty clear that Anna would be one. Her father was in despair. He had let it be known that a rich endowment would go with his daughter. He had held splendid routes to show her off. The young men came, enjoyed his food and drink, were polite to Anna, but went away uncommitted. He could understand it only too well, having lived with her for twenty years, but that made it no better. He wanted grandsons to carry on his business and inherit his money. He also wanted, and this he would only admit to himself, to be rid of Anna. It was not surprising that Menheer Vermilion seldom looked cheerful. When he entered Anna's room on this April afternoon, smiling broadly, Anna raised her eyebrows that were plucked and arched into small Cupid's bows. Her father waved a letter at her. This will please you, Anna, only to think you were complaining this morning that there was no gaiety in Antwerp. She extended her hand for the letter. What's all this coil? A wedding? Why should I want to go to a wedding? 
she laughed bitterly, unless it were my own, and I see no sign of that. But this is no ordinary wedding, Anna, said her father eagerly. Jean Clace and Marguerite Willems are to be married in the cathedral, and there will be a splendid breakfast. Guests will come from far and near, from Bruges and Ghent, perhaps from London even. You know how wide is Clay's trade, and Jan is his eldest boy. You will meet every likely young man in the world of commerce, surely among them. A speculative look came into Anna's eyes. I shall need new clothes, of course. I have nothing to wear, not a rag to my back. Menhir Vermilion mentally reviewed the array of dresses, cloaks, shifts, and accessories his daughter had ordered for Christmas, but decided that it would be not politic to refer to them. By all means, my dear, he said, anything you fancy. And grandmother's jewels. You must take them out of the chest and have them cleaned at once. Her father's brow furrowed. Would it be wise, my dear, to go through the streets in them? The cabochon emerald, the color of pearls and rubies, what with the rogues that are about, and all these infernal Spaniards from the Duke of Anjou's household, just waiting to massacre us as they did in 76. Anna thumped her dressing table with a small fist. I said I wanted them, and I'll have them. See to it. She whirled round to face the mirror and began to push the front waves of her hair this way and that, admiring the effect. Her father watched her, his face worried, and said. He laid a hand gently on her shoulder. Anna, you will be good, my little girl, this time, when it might mean so much. Anna tossed her head. I don't know what you mean, child. You know very well. Speak gently and softly as a woman should. Conduct yourself modestly. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall, says the scripture. Don't preach to me, father. We get enough of that on Sundays and I hope I know how to conduct myself without advice from you. Her father sighed as he turned to leave the room. Your tongue is your worst enemy, daughter, he said. From the antechamber, his little dog, an aged griffin, trotted in, hearing his master's voice. It approached Anna's skirts and sniffed them interestedly. Some pleasant-smelling morsel of food had fallen from the table at dinner and still clung to the fabric. Anna aimed her sharp-pointed slip at the dog in a kick that sent it sprawling across the room with a shriek of pain. Anna, you wicked girl, her father picked a small creature up and fondled it. You have hurt his side. You might have killed him. A good thing, too, stinking cur. Keep it out of my chamber. I'll have it hanged. She began to polish her already pink and shining nails. Minhir Vermilion left her without a word. The dog cradled in his arms and went to his own room, where he knelt and prayed. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and life unto the bitter in soul? The weeks that lay between the arrival of the wedding invitation and the wedding day were a foretaste of purgatory for Anna's servants. She sent to dressmakers, milliners, glove makers, to prepare for her the best possible twilight for the great day. Her maids were ordered to rise at dawn and gather herbs from which to make whitening lotions for her skin. The already golden hair was colored even brighter with an infusion of the flowers of chamomile, the slender waist compressed almost to vanishing point by that ingenious instrument of torture, an iron corset. The finest leather in Antwerp was sought out to make her new shoes and dyed to the exact color of her dress, a celestial blue embroidered thick with artificial pearls and semi-precious stones. Her slender neck, like the stamen of a flower, was to be shown off against the background of the very newest and most glorious of ruffs. The old-fashioned concertina type of ruff had given way to the wired lace collar, more comfortable, becoming, and spectacular than its predecessor. Fan-shaped, it backed the head, descending to points at the junction of the sleeves and bodice. As a maiden, Anna was entitled to display her bosom, adorned with a necklace of rubies and pearls, which had been her grandmother's most precious ornament, as well as by a triple-twined rope of larger pearls. She chose for it a Genoese lace design, edged with gold, and supported on a golden wires arrayed in triple layers. So elaborate was the pattern that the ruff took as long to make as the rest of her wardrobe put together. Day after day, an apologetic servant would be dispatched to the lace maker's cottage to inquire about its progress. He dared not, for shame, deliver his mistress' threats, so abusive were they. For though it might have been supposed that the acquisition of so much finery 
would improve Anna's temper. The reverse was the case. Never had ship used her servants so savagely. Elizabeth, Greta, and Joanna went in hourly fear that she would do them some serious mischief. When her father's little dog died from a growth which had resulted from the kick she had given it, she laughed and vowed she would serve another the same. Riding through the streets in her coach one day, she encountered the admiring gaze of a young Spanish soldier belonging to the train of the Duke of Anjou, who had moved into Antwerp that spring in the hope of taking over the rule of the city. Another girl might have blushed or smiled, or merely returned his looks coldly. Anna leant from her coach window and loosed at him such a torrent of invective, calling him a foreign dog, smircher, womankind, and the like, that a crowd gathered to listen, and Anna's coachman feared for his life, seeing the young man's hand on his dagger. The devil will claim her for his own one of these days, said an old woman who stood by. Nay, she'd be the death of him, answered her neighbor. He'll dispatch her to lead apes in hell, and so keep her out of his way. At last, on the eve of the wedding day, all the finery was ready, except for the rough, which now had to be starched and set in place. When she saw it after the household laundress had dealt with it, she threw it on the ground and seized the woman by the throat, shaking her like a terrier with a rat and beating her. The terrified woman managed to escape and ran to the kitchen hysterical with fright, saying that she would never venture near her mistress again. Two more laundresses were sent for, but their efforts at starching pleased Anna no better. As the old story says, then fell she to swear and to tear, to curse and ban, casting the rough under feet and wishing that the devil might take her when she wore the neckerchiefs again. But at last the rough was starched to something like her satisfaction. On the morning of the wedding day, the 27th of May, she rose at dawn and called up her maids. They dressed her from head to foot in her new clothes, so that when the sun rose she was a glorious sight to see. Her spreading blue gown was the color of the May skies. Gems and pearls glittered on it and set off the fair skin of her bosom and neck. Her hair was dressed in a tower of curls and crowned with a pearl circlet from which a pendant hung on her brow. Two long rolled ringlets graced her shoulders. Only the ruff remained. Elizabeth and Joanna took it carefully from its wrappings and set it about Anna's neck, tear ranged behind delicate tear, and prepared to secure it. That's not the way, you dolts, their mistress shouted. You have set it all amiss, and she wrenched the laces apart. But, madam, began Joanna. Anna slapped her face. The girl put her hand to the scarlet mark and her eyes met those of Elizabeth in a long look. Then she went to the window and opened the casement, standing before it with her back to the room, a white kerchief in her hand. "'What are you about, wench?' demanded Anna. "'Get on with your work.' "'I am not well, madam,' replied the maid in a faint voice. "'I must have air for a moment.' Anna frowned impatiently. "'McGreams, you, Lisa, see if you can do it better than this fool.' There was a timid knock at the door, and Greta, the youngest maid, entered. If you please, madam, there is one to see you, she said. Anna spun round. On this of all days? I can see no one. Tell them to go about their business. Madam, he will take no denial, began Greta. She was pushed aside by the collar, and there stood before Anna a remarkably handsome young man, dark complexion and red-lipped. He appeared to be no flamand. His doublet was of the finest black velvet, his trunk slashed with scarlet, his hose of black silk. A short cloak of rich leather swung gracefully from his shoulders. The plumed velvet cap he swept off revealed black, closely curling hair. Anna's eyes widened with admiration, but she began to rail at him out of custom. God's body, sir, how dare you invade my chamber? I'll have you thrown into the street. He darted forward, knelt at her feet, and snatching one of the white hands, clenched at her sides, kissed it. His voice, when he spoke, was soft and heavily foreign. Anna could not identify the country, but she listened fascinated to his speech. For madam, forgive my intrusion. The blaze of your beauty has drawn me here, as a lamp, the poor moth. Since I saw you into your house yesterday, I have waited impatiently to approach you and beg you to pity me. Anna was flattered and impressed, but determined not to show it. You would do better to approach my father, sir, if you mean honorably. And it is no time to woo now, for I must leave within the half hour if these thick-fingered ninnies will finish their work. Look, what a havoc they have made. She snatched up a hand mirror and surveyed disgustedly the crooked drooping frills of lace. The stranger rose swiftly and bowed. Your maids do not set your rough to your liking, madam. 
It happens that I have great cunning in the art, for in my country these new collars are much worn. If it will please you to dismiss your women, I will take their place. Anna hesitated and yielded. You can do no worse than they, I suppose. Go to the antechamber, both of you, and wait until I call. Silently, the two girls left, shutting Anna in with the unconventional visitor. Standing behind her chair and bidding her face the mirror, he deftly pulled and tweaked the rough into shape, straightening bent wires, smoothing out crumpled folds of lace, arranging the highest tier to form a snowy background to the glittering curls. Anna for once was silent. His hands, touching her skin, seemed to burn her, and there was dark fire in the eyes that met hers in the mirror. She was excited, charmed. Her reflected eyes and his exchanged looks that questioned and answered, challenged and yielded. She would willingly have prolonged the operation, but now the ties were fastened and the rough perfectly set. It is exactly to my liking, she said. And my reward? He bent over her, his long hands caressing the white stem of her throat, and gently tilted up her chin. Their lips met in a long kiss. He raised his face from hers, and as she sighed with satisfaction, fastened his hands about her throat in a vicious grip, and squeezed it tightly. Her choking cries and convulsive struggles were short, for the hands that were strangling her had demonic strength and knew no mercy. A moment later, the door to the antechamber opened, and a black figure strode past the two waiting girls, vanishing down the stairs. When they re-entered their mistress' room, their screams brought the rest of the household running. Something like a broken doll lay on the floor, limp as sawdust, in the blue gem dress. The neck had been wrung like a chicken's. The eyes darted horribly from their sockets. The face was livid, most ugglesome to behold, says the old document. The tongue which protruded from that once pretty mouth was silenced forever. So the devil had taken her at last, said the old woman, for the murdering visitor had been no mortal man, it was clear. None in Antwerp had seen him before, none recognized him from the girl's description. Eerie stories were told of Anna's funeral, how the forebearers were unable to lift her coffin, so heavy was it, so that from curiosity they opened it and found within a black cat very lean and deformed, sitting in the coffin, setting off great ruffles and frizzling of hair to the great fear and wonder of all the beholders. Elizabeth and Joanna said very little of their mistress' death to each other or to the world, which was curious, for Joanna had hated her deeply and had once been heard to swear that she would stop at nothing to be even with her. There had been another who had sworn the same, a certain young Spaniard of the Duke of Anjou's household, whom Anna had so vilely insulted in the street, wounding his pride beyond endurance. When Joanna left her new mistress' service, some months later, married the Spaniard and returned with him to France. The gossips expressed only surprise that she should have wed an enemy of her country. The devil, they said, must have seduced her to his own purpose, and they were nearer the truth than they knew. The Werewolf of St. Claude by Ronald Seth Lycanthropy, the ability of a man or woman to change into a wolf, is a very ancient belief. Now, rejected as a hallucination throughout the history of witchcraft, it is a constantly recurring theme. But at no time did it occur so frequently as during the classical period of the persecution of witchcraft as a heresy, that is from 1450 to 1750. Though there are accounts of werewolves ranging the English countryside, such accounts are more numerous in the annals of continental witchcraft. But there again, there were certain regions which suffered in particular, one of which was the Jura in eastern central France. Here among the mountains and valleys between the Rhine and the Rhone, some of the most terrifying lycanthrope cases were brought to book. In 1521, for example, Father Jean Boin, Inquisitor General, of Besancon tried three men of Poligny, Michel Verdun, Pierre Bougeot, and Philibert Mento, for their alleged werewolf activities. These had first been brought to the attention of the authorities by a traveler, who, defending himself against an attack by a wolf, wounded it. He followed the trail of blood that it left, intending to dispatch it, but the trail led to a cottage where he found Michel Verdun, whose wife was dressing wounds he had acquired, 
so he said while hunting for food. The traveler was unconvinced by Verdun's explanation and reported his suspicions to the authority in Poligny, who arrested the wounded man for questioning as a possible werewolf. Under the inevitable torture, Verdun confessed that he did possess the power to turn himself into a wolf and named two companions who from time to time accompanied him on his lupine expeditions. The two men, Bougeot and Mento, were forthwith arrested and charged with lycanthropy. Bougeot described how he had injured the service of the devil, who had endowed him with the power to change himself into a wolf. A great storm, he said, had scattered his flock some twenty years earlier, and while he was out looking for them, he had encountered three horsemen dressed in black, who civilly asked him what he was searching for. When he told them one of the horsemen, whom he later identified as Philibert Mentot, promised to help him on condition that he would become his servant in everything he demanded. Bougeot consented, and within a very short time found the sheep. Not long afterwards, Bougeot met Mentot again, and from their conversation learned that the horseman had made himself a compact with the devil. At Mentot's suggestion, Bougeot also made a compact, denying his Christian faith and kissing Mentot's hand. Bougeot's heart was not really in witchcraft, however, and within a couple of years, he embarked on a slow process of reconversion. This did not meet with Mentot's approval, and he ordered Verdun, who was also the, under the, his influence, to keep Bougeot up to the mark. One of his measures to effect this was to promise Bougeot money, provided he remained faithful to the devil. Bougeot was persuaded, and before very long he agreed to attend his first Sabbath. At some point during the ceremonies, Verdun ordered Bougeot to strip naked, and when he had done so, he rubbed him all over with a magic ointment. As soon as he was completely covered with the ointment, Bougeot found that he had been transformed into a wolf. Next, Verdun and Pinto stripped and anointed one another with the ointment. They too became wolves, and together with Bougeot went on a foraging expedition. When they returned, they applied another ointment to one another and regained their human shape. Henceforward, the three men met regularly and practiced lycanthropy. Under torture, Bougeot made a full confession of his and his companions' werewolf activities. As wolves, he said, the three men sometimes ran with a pack of real wolves, and from time to time mated with the females, when he declared they had as much pleasure in the act as if they had copulated with their wives. Bougeot also told his inquisitors of his killing and eating children, once he said was a four-year-old girl whose flesh he found particularly savory. He also described that he had once almost been caught. He attacked a boy of seven, but the child screamed so much that people came running, and he only got away by scrambling into his clothes and returning to his human shape. This polygny case caused widespread consternation at the time, and it entered the record of classical witchcraft when Johann Weyer, one of the earliest witchcraft skeptics, recounted it in a book which had an extensive circulation in the mid-16th century, De Pregatis Demonium published in 1563. The book won continuing fame as a result of the attack made on it by King James VI and the I in his own book, Demonology. Wire had told a story to demonstrate that lycanthropy was in fact a delusion, but a later demonologist, Grand Jeu Henri Bouquet, repeated in his great work on witchcraft, Discours des Sorcerers, to prove the exact opposite of Weyer's contention. Henry Bouget was a principal judge of St. Claude, one of the chief towns in the Jura, and his overall fame rests as much on his record as a witch trial judge as it does on his discourse, which is almost totally based on his personal experiences, for it was he who instituted one of the most extensive witch hunts in the Jura. Among the cases he recounts, one relates to a family living in St. Claude called Gandillon, consisting of two sisters, their brother, and his son three of whom were brought before him in 1593, accused of lycanthropy. The fourth member of the family, Perinette, met a death perhaps even more horrible than the burning, to which Henri Bouquet condemned her brother, her sister, and her nephew. One sunny September morning in 1593, Madame Bedel, who lived at Nazian, a small village not far from St. Claude, was once more in labor. The child soon to be born was her ninth, but only three of her children now survived. Benoit, age 16, Maria, age 12, and Anne, age 4. Maria, on her mother's instructions, 
Had Ray gone to fetch the neighbor who had agreed to help her, and the neighbors bustling about the kitchen had frightened the four-year-old Anne, who had in any case been made apprehensive by her mother's contortions and moans. Though not comprehending what was happening, with childish intuition the little girl had understood that her mother was not the calm, loving mother she usually was, and had gone to comfort her only to be rebuffed. This too she had not understood, and had begun to sob. The loud voice of the neighbor and her self-important fussing had increased her uneasiness, and the sobs had turned to bellows, which a direct scolding did nothing to soothe. What can we do with a child, the woman demanded. Shall I take her into the orchard, Maria asked. No, I shall want you here. Ah, there, Benoit, Benoit, she called, come here. The youth put down the pail he was carrying and crossed to the cottage door. Madame, he said, your mother, her time has come, and this naughty child bellows so loudly one cannot hear one speak. She told him, Maria must stay to help. Take the little one and keep her amused for an hour. But I am helping my father, Benoit protested. Now you must help your mother, the woman exclaimed, and thrusting Anne out of the door, shut it in their faces. Benoit picked up the little girl and kissed her. There, there, he soothed, don't cry. Mama, the child cried. Mama will be all right. Come now, dry your tears, and we'll see if we can find you a nice, ripe, juicy apple, and then we will go and look at the pigs. You like the pigs, don't you? Between sobs, the child nodded, and presently, as her brother carried her towards the orchard, talking quietly to her, and now and again nuzzling his lips against her cheek, she quietened. In the orchard, Benoit walked from tree to tree, testing the fruit, but found none sweet enough for a little girl to eat without galling the belly gripes. I know, he exclaimed, and began to run through the trees with her until he came to the edge of the orchard and the wood beyond. Here he stopped before a giant apple tree, which ought to have been pruned years since. Because of this oversight, fruit now grew only on the topmost branches, where the newer growth was, but they were the earliest apples to mature and were crisp and sweet and rosy-cheeked even now. Putting his baby sister on the ground at the foot of the tree, he swung himself up into the branches. Don't move, he called down to Anne, and I'll bring you a beautiful apple directly, but I shan't unless you stay there until I come again. Laughing, the child assured him, I stay here. The foliage thickened as he mounted. It was so thick by the time he was halfway up that on looking down he could not see the ground. So it was that he did not observe a large animal emerge from the wood and stand its right paw poised in midair, its muzzle delicately raised. For a moment it stood, then half cowering slowly and silently began to stalk towards the apple tree. Though she did not recognize it for the wolf it was, Anne was instinctively afraid and began to scream with all the force of her lungs. In response, the animal bared its fang and set up an angry snarling. From both screams and snarls, Panama realized that there was something very amiss at the foot of the tree, and half scrambling, half falling, he began to descend with all speed. On reaching the ground, he saw with relief that the animal had not yet attacked a child, and that immediately it had caught sight of him, it had turned its attention to him. Seizing the knife from his belt, half crouching, he taunted the wolf to attack him, moving all the while as to draw it away from his sister, who, as soon as she had seen him, had stopped her yells, and was now laughing and chattering with excitement. He hoped the wolf would decide not to join combat, for it was a large female, and females were reputed to be more courageous than males except when hunting in packs. In a moment or two, however, he realized that the animal was hungry and that it meant to be satisfied. Doubtful of his ability to deal single-handed with it, he began to shout for help, praying that there might be workers in the nearby field who would hear him and come to his aid. At the sound of his voice, the wolf seemed to sense that if it did not attack at once, its prey would escape, and with a cry, half bark, half howl, it suddenly leaped on the boy. The noise it made and the suddenness of its movement once more frightened Anne, and as Wolf and Boy struggled on the ground, she began to scream again. As the boy fought desperately to keep his assailant from his throat and to reach its throat with his knife, he heard vaguely the shouts of men and women. The wolf heard them too and increased its efforts. With a strength which sprang from hopelessness, Benoit managed to draw back the hand holding the knife, but as he was about to plunge it into the wolf, the beast seized his wrist, wrenched the knife away, and plunged it into his throat. But even in the split second that the attack had taken the boy, saw something that took away all his strength. The paw that seized his wrist and the paw that wrenched the knife from his hands were not pads of an animal at all. They were human hands. The wolf had time to make only one jab at him. For at that very moment, seven or eight men and two or three women came running onto the scene, 
Dropping the knife, the animal leapt away, making for the shelter of the woods. While the men pursued it, the woman rushed to the aid of the little girl and wounded boy. There was nothing they could do to help Benoit but make his last moments comfortable. As one of them knelt beside him, cradling his head in her lap, for a brief moment he opened his eyes and spoke clearly and loudly. It had hands for paws, he said. Then choking on the spurt of blood which gushed from his mouth, he died. When the woman had crossed themselves, one of them said, Did you hear? Yes, the others replied. It had hands for paws. Run after the men, the first woman said to the horrified girl, staring down at Benoit's blood sudden shirt, and tell them what he said. Quick, quick, it's not a wolf they are searching for. When the girl caught up with the men, they were already beginning to fear that the wolf had escaped them, and that they were wasting their time carrying on with their search. But on hearing what she had to tell them with angry shouts, they beat through the tangled undergrowth of the wood. And presently one of them found, cowering under a bush, a frightened, gibbering, demented woman seemingly old before her time. With this cries of discovery brought the others running, one of them immediately recognized her. It's Perinette Gandillon from St. Cloud, he exclaimed. What are you doing here so far from home? Her lips moved but no recognizable sounds came from them as she cowered in the grip of the young peasant who held her. Look, her hands have blood on them, another exclaimed, seizing her hands and regarding them closely. But they have no wounds on them. Did you do it? Did you kill Benoit Bedell? Another demanded. At the question, the woman's attitude changed. Drawing herself up, she said proudly, Yes, I killed him. You are a werewolf? I am a werewolf. You admit it. I am a werewolf, she repeated. For a moment, there was stunned silence. Then, with a cry of rage, the young man holding her ripped at her clothes, and in no time she stood naked and haughty before them. The men were struck immobile and speechless at the sight that confronted them. In contrast with the graying hair and the age creases of her forehead, cheeks and throat, they beheld the body of a beautiful young girl. The curves of the milk-white shoulders, the firm, round-up, tilted breasts, the waist tapering to sleek hips were such as they had never seen before, and for a brief time they were spellbound by what they saw. It was the girl who had brought the message who broke the spell. Which, she shrieked, and hurled herself on Perinette Gandillon, tearing at face and body with her work-roughened fingers. With cries rivaling the girl's shrieks, the young men in the party, as though maddened by the beauty that because of witchcraft they could not possess, flung themselves upon the woman. As they tore and clawed at her, helped by the older men, who should have restrained them, she shrieked the pain of what they were doing to her. Presently, they were a heap of flailing, jerking bodies on the ground. Then there came silence broken only by their panting and the moans of their exertions. One by one they pulled themselves away and stood up, and there was not one of them who was not spattered with his victim's blood. They looked down and saw the result of their emotions. What had once been a beautiful body made in the image of Mother Eve, as she emerged in pristine beauty from Adam's rib, was now a heap of mangled flesh and distorted bones without life. A young man leant against a tree and wretched. Above them in the trees, a thrush trilled out his twice-repeated song.